Welcome back to Bumblebee, where today we jump back and forth between Rome, Greece, and Egypt, uncovering the top 10 Cleopatra facts you won't believe. Starting with the ride or die stylist. Men have a deep rooted attachment to their barber. Once they find a good one, it's for life. But what about the ladies? We can be just as loyal to our hairstylist when we find one that does the dye job perfect, or lays and blends your lace like a champ. Cleopatra and Irius show us that we'll stick by a good stylist until the literal end. Irius was the best makeup artist in the Egyptian court and became the queen's greatest confidant. The famous black eyeliner style as seen on Cleopatra was coined by this artist, who used to trace the long black coal lines up the eyes to the temple, exaggerating them and creating the strange U shape at the end of the wing's tail. While little is known about Irius's own life, she was by Cleopatra's side since the queen's ascent and she was her closest friend. She was at the famous battle of Atticum and it was in Irius's arms that Cleopatra died in 30 BC, just shortly before Iris took her own life with Charmaine. And these two ladies made it to the screen in an expensive cult classic. A 1963 film about the story of Cleopatra and Mark Antony was one of the most expensive movies of all time. And if inflation is taken into account, Cleopatra, the movie's name, remains one of the most priciest movies in history even today. The Queen of the Nile has been portrayed on the silver screen by the likes of Claudette Colver and Sophia Loren. And lives on again in the disastrously, historically inaccurate, inevitably soon to be cancelled 2023 Netflix series. But she was most famously played by Elizabeth Taylor in 1963's Sword and Sandals epic that was plagued by production problems and script issues, as well as a personal scandal making worldwide headlines when it was reported that the co-stars Taylor and Richard Burton had an adulterous affair. Its budget eventually soared from 2 million to 44 million, including 200,000 alone for Taylor Cleopatra costumes, with inflations nowadays that's sitting at about 300 million. It was the most expensive movie ever made at the time of its release, and it nearly bankrupted the studio despite raking in a fortune. But as you may know by now, Cleo wasn't all looks. No sooner did Caesar see her and hear her speak than he was immediately fascinated. Cassius Dio wrote that of Cleo in Caesar's first meeting. It would be a short few years before Roman propaganda painted Cleopatra as a debauched temptress who used her lustrous appeal as a political weapon, an image that's carried on to present day. Before the post humorous smear campaign, Homegirl was more renowned for her intellect than her appearance. She spoke as many as a dozen languages and was educated in math mathematics, philosophy, oratory, alchemy, and astronomy. Egyptian sources even later described her as a ruler who elevated the ranks of scholars and enjoyed their company. There's also evidence that Cleopatra wasn't as beautiful as hyped up to be, however it's effing rude to brag about finally proving a woman isn't beautiful, especially when the definition of beauty has changed so much. The historical coins do show her portrait with more of a hooked nose, and many paintings and statue busts depict her as having strong features paired with delicate feminine bone structure. Seems pretty beautiful to me. For his part, the ancient writer Plutarch claimed that Cleopatra's beauty was not altogether incomparable and that it was instead her melodic and entrancing speaking voice paired with irresistible charm that made her so desirable. So if you love beauty and hygiene but also love science and alchemy, you get a girl boss with a business. We've already established that Cleopatra was interested in alchemy but she also understood a bit of actual chemistry. She believed in the power of fragrance not just as a cosmetic but also as a tool of persuasion. I mean, think of how Cleopatra doused her ship's sails with perfume before sailing to her first rendezvous with Mark Antony to make sure that he smelt her before he saw her. Tell me that's not some revolutionary genius. The same genius that leads her into developing and then owning a perfume factory, which sort of seems like a cool, odd side job for a queen, but if you can't find the sort of mind control fragrances you need at Sephora, there's probably some value in just having it done yourself. The ruins of Cleopatra's perfume factory are by the Dead Sea near Ian Getty, and there is evidence that it also operated as a sort of day spa. Some seating remains, which is reminiscent of chairs that you might sit on to have your nails done, or if you too wanted to be doused in mind control fragrance. Cleopatra wrote two books, one being perfume recipes recorded in the Glinisicarium Libri, which has unfortunately been lost, 
likely in the Library of Alexandria, and the medical treatise called Cosmetics, a medical and pharmacological workbook including several remedies for hair loss and dandruff. The last of my Cleo Beauty rundown for you is the daily donkey milk bath. Like pretty much every human being, Cleopatra had an innate desire to avoid getting older. Thank God she's the queen of like nine places so she can pursue all the ridiculous elaborate beauty regimes that aren't available to the average person to her heart's content. In fact, Cleopatra's favorite spa treatment was something most modern American billionaires would even have a hard time pulling off even once nowadays, never in mind every morning. Cleopatra's daily bath required a tub, two sets of hands, and 700 lactating donkeys. At first this might sound kind of like something a queen made up to keep her servants busy, but bathing in donkey milk was actually not some crazy Cleopatratism. All over the ancient world, women used donkey milk to keep their skin pale, moisturized, and wrinkles at bay. Emperor Nero's wife was set to travel with a whole troop of she-asses, so she'd never have to miss her daily donkey milk bath. And today scientists know that donkey milk has a lot of important health benefits. It can be used as a cow milk substitute for people with allergies. And Yes, it's also used in our modern beauty products, just in case you don't think you'll be able to procure yourself 700 donkeys and enough servants to milk them every day. I actually recommend lip balms made of it, it's super buttery and you'll never have softer lips. And speaking of spending a fortune on a bath, how about a meal, the trillion dollar bet? Cleopatra was not at all fussed about throwing her money away, or more accurately, dissolving it to prove a point. She regaled herself as a god, and while that status guarantees riches, it elevates her above man's greedy desire to obtain them. She felt no better way to show off her power was to show off how little money could persuade her. Makes sense. So according to the story, it was either that Cleo bet Mark, or Mark bet Cleo, either way, one of them said that she couldn't blow 10 mil on a single meal. To give you an idea, that's about 10 million to 20 million in today's money. The bet occurred at a banquet in most stories in which many of the nobles were attending and a fortune had already been spent to host them. How could she spend more? By ordering a weak, crappy cocktail and a mediocre meal. She took off her fat pearl earring and Pliny the Elder said the pearl was the largest in the whole of history, and a remarkable and truly unique work of nature. But who knows how much they paid him to write that. Cleo then dropped the pearl into her vinegary crappy cocktail. Fun fact, pearls dissolve in vinegar. Then she drank the cup of dissolved pearls and crap alcohol, probably now worth hundreds of millions if not trillions, thus proving that she would do just about anything to win a bet. On the topic of her and Mark, let's learn about their intimidable livers. Sounds like a sick ass band or a club name. And it was. Cleopatra first began her legendary love affair with the Roman general Mark Antony in 41 BC. Their relationship had a political component. Cleopatra needed Antony to protect her crown and maintain Egypt's independence. Antony needed to access Egypt's riches and resources. But they were also very, very famously in love, if not at least always desiring to be in each other's company. According to ancient sources, they spent the winter of 41 to 40 BC living a life of leisure and excess in Egypt, and even formed their own drinking society known as the Intim. Livers, as a group to honor the god Dionysus, but also likely to have fun and drink and revel. The group engaged in nightly feasts, group debauchery, and wine binges, and its members occasionally took part in elaborate games and contests. Apparently, one of Antony and Cleopatra's favorite activities, whether it was after these meetings or in broad daylight on a random Wednesday, supposedly involved wandering the streets of Alexandria in disguise and playing pranks on its residents. Can't tell me that that is not two people in love right there. But now the question remains. Where where are the bodies? Cleopatra and Antony may or may not have died together. If not, it was pretty consecutive. So someone made sure they were buried together. At least that's what Plutarch tells us. Beyond that, we have no idea where the two of them ended up. Some historians think that they were buried in Alexandria, most of which fell into the sea after an earthquake 1600 or so years ago. But according to Remskla, a few archaeologists think that the couple could be buried under the traps, the Taposirius Magna Temple, one dedicated to her patron god Osiris and Isis about 30 miles west of Alexandria. Cleopatra considered herself and her lover to be the living embodiments of Isis and Osiris, so a temple burial is pretty fair to assume. If the pair were buried beneath the temple, it would have been an effective strategy to keep their bodies out of the hands of Romans. Archaeologist Kathleen Martinez found four burial chambers and more than 600 artifacts at said temple, many of which bear 
bear the likeness of Cleopatra and Mark. But so far, the tomb itself remains undiscovered. Cleopatra probably would have been mummified since she was known to follow the Egyptian customs and practices, but Plutarch writes that Mark Antony was cremated in Roman custom. So if archaeologists do discover the tomb, it's unclear what state they might actually be in, if together at all. What else is lost is their lineage. I'm talking 23 Cleopatra and me. Heritage websites might be able to tell you about your Greek heritage. Without a body, it'll never be able to find the descendants of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Cleopatra's first child was the son of Caesar, the famous Caesarian who she sends to India to escape Octavian, only to be lured back after she died and killed by Octavian. But Cleo also had twins, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene, as well as another son, Ptolemy Philopandros, all by Mark Antony. At least one of these children survived to adulthood and went on to have children of their own, and that would be Cleopatra Selene, who married King Juba of Mauritania. The couple had a boy and a girl, but only the boy's name is remembered, leaving the girl unknown to history. Called Ptolemy after the kajillions of other Ptolemies who came before him, the young man was killed by Emperor Caligula, evidently because he looked too good in purple or had too full of a head of hair. Whether Ptolemy had any children before getting smoked is unknown, but without more evidence, it's also impossible to know if his unnamed sister lived long enough to have children too. The list of possible descendants is a convoluted line of so and so maybe heirs, finally filtering down to the one person who loudly proclaimed to be a descendant of Cleopatra, the Syrian queen Zenobia, who conquered Egypt 200 years after Cleopatra's death. But it's just as likely that Zenobia's claim was pure propaganda. She was a conqueror and probably looking for a way to strengthen her claim. Either way, it's kind of fun to imagine that out there somewhere might be an oblivious Cleopatra descendant sleeping off a wicked college party hangover in a basement apartment with one window before their next shift at the Cheesecake Factory. But we'll never know for sure. And now for the elusive story of Cleo and the Biblical King. This is two generations worth of beef for y'all, so let's get into it. Herod the Great, a villain of the New Testament ruling over Judea, was Cleopatra's rival even before her affair with Antony, who was a close friend of his. As a Ptolemy, Cleopatra maintained a hereditary claim on Judea, but Herod also hated Cleo for coming to the defense of his mother-in-law of the Hasmonean dynasty when he was planning to kill her and his new wife's whole family. Cleopatra would later demand from Antony that Herod's whole kingdom be surrendered to her. But because Herod had been a loyal friend, Antony only stripped Herod of date and song plantations. Herod is then said to have considered a coup against Cleopatra, but was wisely talked out of as Antony would probably kill him in return. So when Cleo and Mark died, did the rivalry end there, or did Herod continue to fear the Ptolemies even after the famous queen took her life? After all, all four of her kids had stakes in Judea and were still alive in that time. Given the vibe of Herod, so power hungry and parent annoyed and he had his own sons put to death as rivals, he hated all them kids. If we credit the Gospel of Matthew, then we also know that Herod was particularly threatened by children born under auspices and omens, which would have led him to be doubly wary of Cleopatra's twins. Cleopatra Selene not only survived childhood, but went on to become the queen of Mauritania. She and her husband Juba had the implicit trust of Augustus and did not need to make the frequent visits back to capital to secure goodwill like Herod does. When Selene and Juba founded a port city named it after Caesar, Caesar, Herod commenced building two even bigger cities and naming them after Augustus. While Cleopatra Selene and Juba appear to have effortless military expansions, Herod is obliged to get permission for his military exploits and he overstepped on at least one occasion, prompting an angry letter from Augustus. Given these tensions, it's hard not to imagine that Herod, at the least, if not Selene, did not wish each other well. However, whether or not an active rivalry between Herod and Cleopatra Selene existed, the king of Judea was a pivotal contemporary figure in her life by which Selene must have measured most of her accomplishments. Herod comes down to us through history well no more well known than Cleopatra Selene purely due to her gender, but also because her reign was one of relative peace and prosperity, lacking the big splashy family drama that marked Herod's family rule. Finally, the Ptolemies had calmed down, and it only took the fall of Egypt. Alright, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed. As always, be sure to like and subscribe to see more of our content, and until next video, comment down below your thoughts on the stereotyping of Cleopatra.